Welcome back to the Handstand Cast with uh, myself, Mikael Christensen, and Emmett Lewis. Hello, uh, welcome back to our second episode. We are, yeah, happy to be back as usual. Not that we went anywhere really. We're all just uh, downing some coffee right now, so if you hear any <laughs> slurping noises, that's uh, Mikael being a savage with his coffee, whereas I am a bit daintier myself and just take gentle sips. Yeah, stop being so civilized. I know, civilized. Civilize the mind, but make the body savage, or some fitness <laughs> nonsense <laughs> like that. I love trash quotes. I think Especially, the only the only quote I actually like is the one that says, "If you're not confused, you're not paying attention." <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that 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 strikes a lot of truth. That's, that strikes a lot. Of truth. It's basically like <laughs> summing up the core values of insight tradition and Buddhism. Mm. If you don't know what the fuck is going on probably not paying attention anyway i suppose we should uh tell you what we're up to we are here with the handstand cast once again with our second episode and we last week we kind of talked and rambled about what the handstand is to us context and all these other things we thought for our second episode we're gonna talk about coaching how do we actually transmit information in a way that makes it practical to people to be able to go from i'm standing on my feet to i'm standing on my hands and I'm not smashing my face into the floor. It's a broad topic. We'll probably have to come Very back well. to this one a few times, but uh, mm. hopefully we'll get started on it anyway. Uh, this kind of ties into, this is, I suppose, the theory, the ramble, not the theory, the rambling around what we do in Handstand Factory. So, you know, if you have the course, you'll be able to understand a bit and possibly put a bit of context on that. If you haven't got the course, then with my shameless plug, buy it. No, <laughs> or else Mikhail starves and I have to feast upon his corpse. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> other than that, yeah, let's get to it, I suppose. So, yeah, coaching. What uh, kind of topics do you want to cover when we talk about coaching? Um, I just find like the entire, I mean, entire idea of coaching essentially is, yeah, transmission of information, uh, but doing it in a way where people can make something practical out of it. Uh, and i mean going going from that definition i think that um first of all um you need to see who this person is that you're trying to coach uh and what that person needs uh so i mean when i started coaching i mean in the beginning i was doing like i was teaching just a little bit of like kind yeah. of more random workshops but then as i started kind of actually getting interested in it is I, I mean, I started te- like my first teaching work I ever did. It wasn't really work. I, like when I did karate, I was doing uh, Tani Hashitori karate, karate when I was like around 14 to 20 something. Um, like I was kind of the assistant trainer. So I was, I was introduced to Well, you don't know about Mikael is you could kick your ass <laughs> if you chose to. <laughs> I'd probably get my, kick my own ass. But um, MMA career starting soon. <clears throat> definitely i'm gonna like i'm gonna fight myself and lose um (laughs) but so just like getting used to being in the context of being a teacher is i mean that's been kind of in my life for a while but then being a good teacher is just something else entirely and i think it's just it's more of kind of a people job than it is a numbers job in, in, in general and like this is what kind of gets to me with all these kind of like books on coaching or on like life coaching or on uh, yeah. how to get rich and whatnot. All this crap. It's just like, it's not necessarily crap, but I think it's just... It's a it, lot of this crap, let's be yeah, honest. Yeah, 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 definitely. But it, it's just like these generalized rules that are supposed to apply always and like nothing applies always. Hence, if you're not confused, you're not paying attention. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but like... No, nothing always applies and that's where like it both becomes difficult and interesting for me when it comes yeah, to teaching here. it's kind of i suppose anyone who's done any coaching with me or done any the workshops or anything it's uh you'll probably notice my favorite answer is it depends <laughs> and it really does it's there is no one true thing there's no one true exercise there's no one true direct path to all these things if there was someone would have found it i don't know 200 300 years yeah, ago exactly like at the end of the day yeah, if we go back to the history of acrobatics, we can chase, trace, follow the trail of acrobatic training in a semi-formalized manner back to 3000 BC in China. So 
if there was a perfect way to do something, someone would have found it. If there mm. was a perfect technique, it would have been found, possibly hidden, but then disseminated at some point. Yeah, I mean, I think the the only like <clears throat> real constant is that you need to do something yeah. of the thing that you're trying to achieve, or else it's not going to happen. That's 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 pretty kind of taken for taken for granted. Yeah. But um, speaking more like more specifically about handstand coaching. Um, or like yeah other kind of skill coaching of course i think the the largest import most important thing is just actually knowing your subject matter of course yeah and having i think for me like there's i'm kind of one thing just to say on the subject matter it's there's a mistake i see in all all fields of coaching not just handstands but uh particularly in handstands at the moment because it's quite new discipline is people are making the mistake that i can do the skill therefore i can teach the skill mm. and what you actually get is like if someone is very good at the skill it's they know how to do it for themselves so if you are a genetic match for this person in terms of like same size weight age training background then following their advice to the key will probably get you there but for most of the time we are not the same person unless yeah. we're twins <clears throat> so it's kind of it's the difference between this is the difference between what makes a coach and what makes a performer or someone who can perform the skill i mean not as a yeah, entertainment performer but as someone who can perform it yeah so it's kind of like you know yeah probably it's, wouldn't it's, learn boxing off mike tyson but i'd love to learn it off cuz the yeah his coach yeah yeah that kind of thing yeah it's, it's but like I, I do think there is something to be said for like having the experience of the skill because uh, i mean there's there's, oh, there, 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 there's there's many things that you can kind of like i mean I can teach someone how to do a back handspring, though I'm not great at the back handsprings myself. But I, what I can do better actually is say, okay, this person here knows how to back handspring pretty fucking good, and they have a much larger understanding than me because they have immersed themselves in that general type of training for a longer period of time. So I do think that matters, but uh, I think the thing when it comes to yeah like sharing information it's a lot about uh vocabulary and it's about again seeing people seeing like okay so who are you and where are you at and how can we work with that and and i think also maybe more than uh almost anything is just seeing kind of the potential and the limitations okay so you you have you have four hours a week to work on this well yeah. then then we need to be realistic with what you can do with those four hours a week and uh Instead of telling you, oh, well, then, then then you can't get anything done or say you have to work six days a week or so on. Like it's, yeah. it's it's not relevant because you need to see, okay, people usually have lives and yeah. sacrificing everything for whatever practice they're doing is usually not an option. Some can, some yeah. can, but like if they can't, that, well, then that is part of the like the potential versus limitations of how where you can put the practice at. Yeah, exactly. You kind of touch on two things there are important there's one what i call the three w's it's like who am i speaking to who's who has approached me for coaching you know what are they the advice i give someone who's 45 and has three kids is going to be very different to what i give to someone who's 16 and mm. wants to go to circus school yeah exactly. it's just they're different people different context <clears throat> different age so who's who first off who's talking to you it's like okay next where do they want to go Okay, what what is their aspirations with this skill? It's like, oh, I come along and you know this sets. Uh, how to describe it? This sets our realistic time frames that we can achieve things in. It also sets like whether the skill can be achieved or not. It's like, say, someone comes along. I'm sixty three. I want to learn a one arm. So that's who they are and what they want to do. And they'll go well, you know, and I can only train one hour a week. Well, you just have to say, well, sorry, we can't do a one arm in that amount of time frame um, with your body type. It's just not going to happen. So obviously that's an outlier, but it's just given an example. And then we have the last W of like, where are they in relation to their goal? Mm -hmm. So someone comes along and this will set your kind of your training and how you would speak to them and all the concepts. It's like, well, how much do you actually understand about the skill? How much, what's the closest approximation of the skill you want to do? It's like, oh... I want to do a handstand, but I've never been upside down. Okay, well, then maybe we need to regress to a wall plank. Or maybe we need to go all the way back to just a plank. You know, these kind of things. It's like, well, you know, where are you in relation to this, mm. both mentally and physically, is a very important concept. 
Yeah, I think it's like uh, there's a couple of uh, examples that I always think about when when I think about both my own training, my own my, like kind of the coaches I have had and the coaches I've seen around. And I think that one <clears throat> one very um, how to say um, not misunderstood, but like a parameter that's very like it's seldom mentioned, I guess it's also because a lot of kind of coaching is related to fitness and fitness is related to kind of adhering to protocols and doing what you're supposed to. And like, if you're not, that means you're making excuses or if you don't do it, it means that you're like, um, um, like it, that is your own fault. Yeah. But like, so sometimes it's just like, um, it's like, I think Eric Helms wrote that in that muscle and like strength and muscle building pyramid or whatever it was that like, it needs to, it needs to stay interesting for the person doing it. And yeah. I think with practices, uh, like acrobatic practices and hand balancing and these things, like it's even more inter like more important that you find it interesting because the, the results come very slow. So you need to kind of be, find it interesting and making that interesting for a person is, is of importance because like, as he says in that book, like if someone just like finds this to be, be a dredge, like it's not necessarily that they'll quit, but the on average likelihood that they'll do what they should be doing a week is lower. Yeah. And that is, I mean, as a coach, that's what you need to be able to modify and modulate so that they are able to still find it interesting. Because yes, discipline does matter, but you can't, you can't just like always, I've, I've seen that like through the years, especially on the internet, like there's this, this general kind of blame game of no excuses. Yes, I get it. You can't excuse yourself for everything, but yeah. fucking hell, like there are more things to it than that, that like you should feel bad if you didn't do your thing because someone on the internet wrote no excuses. You're not fuck off. Yeah, I think this is the thing is like, if we look at what's going on in fitness and even the history of the fitness industry, it's intimately linked to Judeo-Christian Anglican values of you must work hard and you get your reward later and you must keep working hard <laughs> you, and you, you get the reward later and it's like that's great as a concept if you want to be a surf i suppose as well we, we won't get into the moralities of this but well, it's in, also in, in, incidental uh tangent there i think i don't remember but when i read anthropology in your university there is a book that's called um um what's it called uh it's called the um, I can't remember what the actual work, uh, the actual name of that thing is. Now I got lost. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's the thing. Protestant work ethic. But wasn't it? It's Max Weber who wrote that book. Now I got yeah. super confused. Anyway, um, but yeah, I mean, it does kind of. That was just our producer things. getting very frustrated at us not uh, being able to read. Yeah, the I got confused. I tried to that. try to read her sign <laughs> on the paper, and I was really really confused. I apologize. We're like very Regardless. high tech in our setup here. Yeah, it doesn't like we're actually not speaking about anthropology here anyway. Yeah. Oh well, it's kind of it's straight into anthropology because coaching is a. I don't suppose. It's a bit of anthropological study into people and their mechanisms of uh yeah in that yeah. sense for sure we're gonna bully michael to talk about this later <laughs> i know he's got a lot of interesting ideas on it but it it's does... called the protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism i think it's by max weber ah cool cool but it's just it's kind of like it goes back to this thing of like we need to build consistency with our trainees this is one of the key things i'll drive home i would prefer someone to do a program that i knew was not efficient program was not a good program on paper if i knew they would stick to it and this kind of thing if i knew like you know uh, maybe it wasn't physically or mentally challenging or other stuff but if i can go i know they will do this program and i know they will do it 95 percent of the time that is much better than a program that was like the best program for this person based mm -hmm. on current assessment systems and it would 100 percent guarantee results but they only do it 70 percent of the time mm -hmm. and i was like what i what you deal with as a coach more than anything else is people's frustration with the skill mm. until That's there's true. a certain switch point that I try to coach people towards, which is very different from person to person that you just have to understand what handstands is just like you go in, you do the work. Some days you're a bit better. Most of the days are kind of boring. And I don't know. I have a, a metric. I talk to people say out of 10 workouts, one will be amazing. You will be on fire. It'll be every, like new things. Everything will feel better. Longer hold times, whatever. It's just some, it'll be great. Then two to three of your workouts out of 10, so almost 30% of your workouts will be shit. You just, it, you know, on paper, it might be fine. You might get your hold times. It'll feel terrible. 
you'll feel heavy, you're distracted, you're unable to concentrate, whatever. <clears throat> then the other seven to six, six to seven workouts of that 10, you go in and nothing remarkable happens and you don't even remember them because nothing remarkable happens. It's like your bus ride to school. You just get on the bus or to work or wherever you're going. <laughs> you get on the bus, you arrive at school, you don't even remember what happened. You only remember that bus ride when the, when the dog got on the bus and mm. that kind of thing. Something yeah, happens. Sure. But <clears throat> those ones are the ones that actually like put the money in the bank, so to speak. And mm. they're the ones that slowly over time get better and better. So trying to coach away from like expecting a peak experience in your training sessions and more just like it's just what i do mm -hmm. why do you train handstands i just do it why do you train i just do yeah That's like there was this one thing that i thought about before with like like because i mean teachers have various styles and like different experiences and so on uh and there is this um like and speaking about that thing of having an interesting time when you're doing it like, the first coach i had Corey tabino he's a guy from the States who, he did ENC, the, the, the school in Montreal, uh, many years ago. He did it in aerial straps, actually. They didn't like that like it that much, and he did, did uh, hand balancing himself, kind of in spite of the school. And then he, <laughs> I, he ended up quitting, and but he became a capable hand balancer, and he performed for really many years, and I still, still think he does. But uh, anyway, what he was really good at as a teacher, I mean, of course, he taught me kind of like all the, the basic things that I needed to know in terms of technique and all that. And he saw that I was taking it rather fast, but he was just making it interesting to train. It was f literally fun to train with him. And it was nice. like, I had a good time. And I think the fact that it got to, it got the associations of actually enjoying the activity itself. Obviously I was also enjoying cause I was learning fast, but it was just, it was something I was looking forward to doing. Yeah. And I think being able to to uh, bring that quality forwards is possibly more interesting or more important than anything else. So that just like, it becomes something that you're really looking forward to doing and that you kind of, uh, like you kind of almost have to stop yourself from doing it because you know you can't do too much of a thing either. Yeah. Like that's kind of when you're, and you, when, you, when you find it. But like there's another teacher that I always think of and that is because most of the time, I think in most disciplines, it's good to have a large, wide understanding of how it works and having been able to do it yourself is, yeah. is a large plus. Like it's definitely a large plus, at least to some degree. But uh, uh, the, 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 the teacher for teeterboard in Stockholm, um, in the circus school that I did, his name is Janne Rosén. He, um, I've had several conversations with him about this because he never like, he teaches teeter board, which is basically the plank where you like, you Let me jump. call it like debt plank. Yeah. So like, it's kind of like, what's it called? That kind of system uh, to explain it in words. It's just a seesaw. Yeah. It's seesaw, basically a yeah. seesaw where one person jumps on the end and launches the other person up and they yeah. kind of get like, momentum. Yeah. And they go like seven meters up at kind of. Yeah, and just do crazy flips and all that. And the th interesting thing is that, like Janne, he never he never did that himself. Nor did he even do trampoline. Um, he told me that his daughter did trampolining and gymnastics. He got interested in that, and he kind of learned about the coaching process um, through doing courses and so on. And fast forwards a bunch of years, and he's kind of uh, the best and most kind of sought after trainer in teeterboard in the world. And it's yeah. fascinating because, like, uh, one thing he told me was that. I asked him, like, yeah, but how, how can you have this understanding of these people not only doing very complex stuff in the air, but literally being in mortal danger on every jump if they're not doing everything correctly? And he told me that, like, one of the, uh, the things that had made him a good teacher, he meant, was that he had worked with some of the absolute best in the world and some of the absolute worst, he said. Yeah. So that, like, his... And I think that that kind it kind of like it, it says a lot because it just has to do with experience rather than like starting out by like teaching a million billion people before you kind of have something that you feel solid and confident with and I'd like and I think that is something that he really yeah. is able to bring across that like he's just like been able to work with all these different body types these different ability levels and so on that has just led him to have a very wide understanding of what's going on within these people's minds and bodies as they're doing things he has never experienced before yeah i think that's really like that's that's an exception from the rule definitely but yeah, it's very i think it, the weird thing is you'll actually find obviously he's a very high level but you'll find that a lot in the gymnastics world where people's parents 
I've been watching the club since the person, you know, put them in the club at age four or five. Mm. And then they they take the coaching certs, you know, just to help out because they need more, they always need more bodies at gymnastics clubs. And then suddenly they're like, oh, wait, I'm the assistant head coach at this club and I'm mm. coaching, <laughs> you know, my kid has now graduated gymnastics and is well past it. But I'm still there as a coach, like 15 years later, being the one person going like, okay, let's do a double. Mm. This kind <laughs> of thing. I was like, it's, you know, they've never been in shape, but it's mm. kind of, it sort of separates out that coaching in some ways is is a separate skill. It's a separate a separate skill set mm. from the doing. And while you do need to understand the doing, it definitely helps. It's you can't confuse the doing, how you do it, with how a generalized template for people's bodies and how they should do it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's that kind of And it's interesting there, like you mentioned, like generalized templates. I think that is one of the largest fallacies too. That like um I find this more and more interesting. Like uh, I'm definitely not an expert on um, anatomy, but just looking into like a, a few of the like tidbits I've just literally yeah. read off of internet and various articles or Wikipedia or whatever, how much like how much difference there is in bone structure in muscle insertion, certain muscles that are fused on certain people, certain that have like muscles that like, don't exist for other people. Yeah, exactly. Exist. So there's just like there's so much stuff going on that you can't really know about uh, when you meet a person and which may or may not contribute to levels of talent and whatnot. But yeah. the fact that I can't assume that, and this I think is very relevant to handstand coaching. I can't assume that the way I do things is going to work out perfectly well for another person. And this is where I think circus teaching and circus coaching, I like, I would say in kind of, um, Fails is the wrong word, but like it's it has it its limitations. Question its methods. Yeah, yeah, course. exactly. It need it needs to have its que- methods questioned, and one of the reasons for that is essentially that like if you pass a an audition for a circus school, uh, and you will work with the coaches there, you will be one of the people that will have the attributes that the coaches will be looking for. Yeah. And since you have them, it also means that the coaches that work there, they will mainly be working with the types of bodies that function well for this sort of discipline. Or the ones that they know how to, this is the thing, like, this the types of bodies that they know well how to coach. Exactly. And it's kind of like, it's an interest, just sorry to segue on this thing. It's like, I had two students a while ago, Josh and Morgan, who follow along the boat, still have balance. When they started training with me, they, they would not have been able to get into a single circus school. They would maybe have got into a prep program here or there, but they would not have got into any degree program. But, you know, I knew how to coach them, like seeing their potential. They worked their asses off because they really wanted it. It's no, there's no hesitation in that. A bit of brotherly rivalry. But by the end of like two years, they were better than some people coming out of a three-year degree in hand balance. So it's not, no, maybe that was luck. It's, you know, they're very phys- physically talented. I'm not claiming my own personal success in that. I just guide them through it. But it's still the circus program would have said no, not these people, because they just assessed what their bodies could do at that time and not what their bodies were capable of learning mm. and how fast they could learn it. Mm. So there's this kind of bias thing that leads in that you get coaches. Uh, we were talking about it yesterday. One of our friends who's a hand balancer went to coach with a very well known hand balance coach, and they wanted to do some privates, and the guy. He said, put your hands overhead like this in the shoulder flexion. Took one look at his shoulders like, no, no, shoulder's not good. No, he hadn't seen, but this guy is a machine on his hands. Mm. And uh, so your mom was like, hold on. He just kicked up into like a swetchka, which is a one-arm handstand with legs together. Very difficult. Held it on the floor 15, 20 seconds. And then your mom was like, okay, I'll coach you. Mm. But just based on one singular physical attribute that this guy had decided was not ideal, mm. he just was like, no, I'm not going to coach you. Until he'd seen like, oh, wait, he's very capable. Okay, I'll coach him because now I can just put a bit of my stamp on him. <laughs> yeah, I think it's also like the, um, uh, or what what I, what I fascinates me is this with, uh, it's a little bit like we talked about in the in the first episode, but with this with technique being kind of a, how to say, a artificial concept. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's something we, uh, it's an idea that we have found that we kind of enforce on the body to, make this uh, certain aesthetic, this certain technique, this certain you give give these certain options to the body through this artificial technique. And it works, obviously, but um, 
it's very important to remember that it is an artificial thing. It's yeah. an idea. It's it's a construct that we apply. And as we said in the first episode too, it's like ask a child to kick up. They won't they won't be keeping a rock solid super straight line because like who who is carrying like like who is who is using like the upper back in the trapezius pushing super high through when you carry an object yeah. overhead? No one ever does. It's like it's it's you're, you're using the muscles and the body in, in a new way that is that is very constructed. And I think that it's important to remember so, that this like we are trying to adapt the body to fit this certain technique, uh, which is totally fair. There's nothing wrong with it. But at some point you need to adapt the technique to your body as well. And yeah. I think that is that is where kind of the, uh, if you are taking the technique too seriously and you're, you're adhering too strongly, you might end up at the point where like, hey, but this thing doesn't really work for me. Well, what are you going to do then? Are you yeah. going to kind of just like admit defeat and say, oh, I don't fit for this? Or might you just modify it and yeah. like find out, okay, this actually is something that functions for me. And This is, and, yeah, kind of where the coach comes in in some ways is like a lot of people are good it depends on the level people are coaching but they understand or we would understand the technique to the point where we go like well this is your body this is your phenotype this is how you fit into the technique and now let's try find your version of that technique mm. not just say this is how it must be done mm. it's not you know it's like particularly if we're dealing with people who want to do this as a hobby yeah it's like I want to balance on my hands and I want to experience that and I want to do a 30 second handstand and I have no aspirations of doing a one arm well then that's get you to the point you can balance on your hands and then yeah. you can figure it out from there but it's does it need to be perfect you know it's also like it's one of the things that we deal with a lot or I've dealt with a lot over the years people who've had you know, meniscus issues in their shoulders or labrum hmm. sorry labrum issues in their shoulders from whatever they're doing generally crossfit actually it's most people have labor issues came from CrossFit. It's not an indictment on CrossFit and we're not throwing shade or anything. But so then it's like, well, maybe they're not going to be able to perfectly flex their shoulders overhead, but they can still balance in a pain-free manner and learning how to adapt to these people. This was one of the biggest things I learned as coaching is if people have injury imposed limitations, not even structural ones of the bodies of certain shapes, then you just need how do you make that technique how do you take the principle of the technique and apply it to the body and not the actual imitation of the aesthetic of the technique mm. so yeah yeah it's a complicated matter it kind of turns out like it's this i suppose it's a bit of the internetification of things it's like things become binary yeah. where they're not Very much. there's more it's not just like it is good technique it is bad technique it's there is a range in there of good and bad Sorry, yeah. excuse me, I'm smacking my microphone stand around. <laughs> and, but it's, it's also like uh, like this, um, there's a kind of the mentality around it, like wh why does it need to be exactly like this? Yeah. Uh, but an interesting thing, a friend of mine, uh, Manda, she's a, Manda Riedman, she's a uh, mainly an aerialist and contortionist that lives in Sweden. Um, she's Swedish. She also does hand balancing. Um, and she trained in Kiev for quite a while, and she trained under Natalia, um, Poznyakova, I think is her last name. I'm not sure I say that correctly, but um, at least what she said, and I find very fascinating. And like, I started to to think, or like, because what she or what she said was that basically that Natalia is very good at seeing what fits your body type, uh, yeah. professionally speaking. And what's very cool with that is like she's trained some of, some of the best hand balancers in the world. Like consistently, a lot of the best people in the world come out of there. And I was about to say, when my student Morgan is now her student, yeah, exactly. Uh, but uh, like, I started looking at like a few of the people that had been coached by her, and I was like, hey, but like, they don't do the same tricks. They don't do the same stuff at all. Actually, yeah. like a lot of them have like very distinct styles. Like in, I mean, I'm, I'm sure all of them can do like a Savichka one arm. That's yeah, that's that's, that's kind of a basic when, when you're on high level, but. Like not all of them are performing that, nor are they aiming to do the same things. And I'm like, oh shit! But that's actually that's an interesting way of coaching. Even on like the highest level, you can you can rather gear a person towards being able to to specialize in a certain vocabulary um, 
And I and I mean, yeah. when, when we speak about kind of the artistic side of things too, like in the end, if everyone does exactly the same vocabulary of moves, since there are quite few in hand balancing anyway, it's just going to end up a snore fest. Yeah, and basically. the fact that like uh, having that level of thinking on a very high level, I think it's is is even more important to have that on on yeah. kind of people that just want to do it for fun. Because like, why why should it? Like, even though I'm a professional hand bouncer, why do I need to judge someone else on just that just want to play on their hands? And of course, like you said as well, if someone comes to me and says, hey, I want to get into circus school next year, I'll be like, okay, then you better point your damn toes because, yeah. and, and that's not to please me. It's just that I know that the people the that federation. will look at you, yeah, <laughs> the federation or the people that look at you on the audition, they will have criteria. So I will gear it more towards that. And that's not to say that I won't tell a person that just want to do a handstand that they should point, shouldn't point their toes. Sure they should. Yeah. But uh, like, it's just, it's just a matter of like how much emphasis would I put on one thing versus the other. Uh, just depending on a person's goals and if someone comes and tells them yeah like my goal is to do a 1k in routine one day i'm like okay then we're going to be pretty damn specific about your your one arm yeah. placements like we're not gonna I, I won't allow the person to wobble around in the shoulder and go like in in ways that i would would allow someone who says that yeah i just i like to stand on one arm one day and like i don't really care that much okay fair enough then yeah. you don't need to be as picky on it so it can really have this kind of range and i think in in terms of coaching that is that is a very important thing like yeah. that th this has to do with seeing who's like what you said seeing yeah. who's seeing what and seeing like how Where, yeah. yeah it's this kind of idea just to segue i'd like to uh move on to queuing i always find queuing one of the most interesting sides of coaching mm -hmm. and it's uh for me i have what i consider an interesting style, style of queuing that I give people cues and technique things on two levels. One that I want them to implement immediately, like your elbow's bending, lock your elbow. Mm. But then I also have cues particularly related to sensations and balance and other stuff that's a bit softer, a bit harder to identify. It could be an internal cue that I tell the person the cue, not that I expect them to be able to do it immediately there on the spot, but for when they happen to do it by mistake, they're able to identify it. So they have a terminology go, oh, that's what Emmett meant by when you feel the weight fall through the structure into the balance point, release the fingers. Mm. So it's like moments that would happen in a technique. That's when you, people will go, oh, I can identify that moment. Mm. It's been cued. Then I can react to it. Whereas before mm. they might cruise through this point. Mm. And it becomes, it's interesting because if it's always the same cues, then why doesn't everyone get all the same results? Yeah, good point. It's that thing, whereas if you're trying to build a sensory lexicon, which is what we're trying to do in balance, mm. then we have to explain an experience in some ways mm. and what to do when that experience happens. Mm. Yeah, this is quite interesting with, like, I mainly, mainly had that when I taught in circus schools and stuff where I had uh, the same students, like, day in, day out for a longer period of time. Um, and you see people work on rather advanced stuff. Uh, it's often that um, I can kind of, I can see the person hesitating. Like yeah. I can kind of, I can experience their mind state. And I just say that like, the reason you fell now is because like all your attention was in your left leg when you try to bend it or straighten it or whatever. Yeah. And they'll be like, yeah, like it's, it's as if kind of, and that takes the sole attention of the entire body. And of course, you, you're not any longer focusing on your hand uh, and your shoulder and so on. Yeah. So like being able to to convey that experience of like, okay, hes like hesitation very easily leads to to falling simply because like you're like suddenly your attention shifts somewhere else. Okay. Okay, now I'm gonna kick up to handstand. I'm gonna open my legs, and you kick up to handstand, and you see the person. They are already thinking about opening their legs so much. They they spend like seven tries kicking up to handstand. Yeah, like it's it's a very typical thing. This to um, just be kind of like the, this this mental state that you're in when you're doing these things. So um, being able to uh, yeah guide people through kind of the the experiential state uh, that they're experiencing as they do it is like. It's kind of like you said. It's it's, it's very very different uh, than just doing like technical cueing. Okay, straighten your legs, point yeah. your toes. You need to push your shoulders higher. You need to put your leg there, and so on. Those are kind of 
like more linear and more like those are copy paste cues in yeah, a sense like they're always things, the like, same to get back onto coaching it's like you almost have people i would term copy paste coaches who mm. it's a uh, they know the words and they say them they repeat you know they'll repeat you know some other co- cues they've got over the years or other stuff and that becomes a blanket statement and this is how uh, something gets formalized i suppose into like this is how you must do it why because mm. everyone says the same cues that they received but maybe the queuing needs to be more specific to the person. And this is how, you know, you can get people better faster by just wonder, understanding, like, how do they use language? Do they talk about feeling? Do they need to understand the skill? Mm. Do they need a, I don't know, someone's scared and you just need a bit of gentle hand. Mm. Are they slacking? So you just need to give out to them. Mm. You know, these kind of things It's like, you know, telling someone like, who doesn't really have a concept of what is hard like i want you to squeeze harder Mm. but can we teach them what a hard squeeze is somehow give them Mm. something that approximates it and then get them to replicate it Mm. so it's this idea which when our queuing and coaching comes in it's like how do we actually speak to what's in front of us and how do we take our generalized principle of the technique and give it to someone in a way that they can digest and then take it in digest it and then actually output it Mm. Yeah, that's, I think this is also like in terms of, I mean, people teach differently and I think that that's ultimately a good thing because certain like certain words are going to get you and, yeah. and certain others won't. And it might be a timing thing. It might be a person thing. There's like loads of variables that go into that. But um, essentially what I try to do uh, yeah. is just like, like, and I think it feels an ongoing process is finding out, okay, well, how... How do I experience this? That, how do I experience this? And then, like, I see someone trying, I give them feedback. Then they give me feedback on how the feedback is, and like, then you get build a larger and larger library just on like, okay, how do, how yeah. does this this work? And I mean, like, when you work also online, like with the things that we're doing now with Handstand yeah. Factory, and both of us have like been doing online online coaching, yeah. online coaching for a long time. That was also it's a very interesting experience. Like, yeah. the first. The first one and I think it was a year or one and a half, I just decided like, okay, I, you know what? I don't know if I can teach someone online. So I did it for free. Like yeah. it just, I just wasn't I sure. How Instagram coaches could say that. <laughs> I'm not sure I can coach it. Rather yeah. than like DM me for coaching. Yeah. The good point. I mean, I, uh, for, for me at least, it was just really important to just like, okay, can I give you results? I just don't know. Uh, yeah. And I just had to figure, figure that out first. So I tried for a while. Um, and saw that I was getting decent results, and and it's it's interesting this with the coaching process as well, with because it's it's easy to imagine and attribute everything to the coaching itself. But like I also started understanding over time is like, but when a person pays you for coaching or does coaching, they're actually also paying uh, to make sure that they themselves are going to do the job because there will be an expectation on, on them yeah, because definitely. they they just put a substantial amount of money in, into it and they know someone is sitting there and waiting for your 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 video or yeah. your your results or your effort uh, and the fact that like this is an enormous reason again to get that consistency going and consistency is more important than what exercises you do uh so that like or as, as long as they're at least, yeah, least relevant um close approximation exercise yeah. is what you should be doing yeah uh, but yeah just seeing that okay there are there are some 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 types of queuing that work and um how it's different as well i, I feel like kind of my my in-person coaching has been influenced by the online and vice versa in in yeah. good ways just because like get, getting like just a higher degree of input on like on what I'm doing to a person. And I think that like perhaps the most important thing of all, especially when it comes to online work, is just like being fucking honest with the, with clients. And yeah. it's like, okay, I can't guarantee anything whatsoever. And yeah. this, this pisses me off when you, when you get those like fucking, um, that's in 28 hours. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, learn this or that in 10 minutes. Just like all this nonsense. It's just like yeah. you can't guarantee anything. Like you can you can offer something, and then yeah. the p- person can work, and you can see because like the variables of the bodies, the variables of the time schedules, all this will influence yeah. whether or not it works. So I just think it's very important to yeah, to have that least, level of honesty or something. Yeah, it's kind of. 
Yeah, it's just to segue sort of my own experience of online coaching, it's interesting. Online coaching has now, I don't know, completely changed how I train, train people in person. Because I would have had, you know, I learned to coach handstands from circus school, essentially, just mainly from watching. And I was also a base, so flyers would have to be coached for handstands. So kind of picked it up that way. But a lot of the training I done in circus school was I would spot for position. I would literally just put the person into the position they want and move their body around for them. Now I've stopped spotting in real life from my experience of online coaching. And I only spot for safety or if someone is having like, say contortion, handstands and stuff like that. I'll squash people in because sometimes you just got to squash people into the right shape so they get used to it. But for one arms and other stuff, it's like I've just eliminated it because I've realized there's a hierarchy of developing the sensory balance mechanism that needs to be developed before the one arm will actually develop. And mm. if you're spotting and holding people in the position, they're not learning anything. Yeah, and it's kind of. Yeah, I'm very, very skeptical to the entire spotting business myself. Yeah. So it's kind of <laughs> like it started because, like, when I first started coaching, I was coaching people like they wanted to learn handstands. I was like, I didn't know if I could. Same look, I didn't know if I could coach a handstand online. It's like, okay, I could probably teach you the basics some wall drills and then i had to like level up like well how do we how do we actually teach this is the interesting thing to me is like well if we're in person you can try out like you could try 10 drills at once in a 20 30 minute session and go try this one try this one you find one that works whereas with you training people online you give them a drill but the time they got a video back to you might be three four days later yeah so they then, don't want to waste their time either. yeah so it's like well what can we do? Mikael's kicking my table again. Again, you were again. the last time. No, <laughs> constantly kicking the tables. But uh, it's it's so it came up with like this idea of like investigating constraints. It's like, can we set up a situation to this person that we've described that is built on what they can already do, which is just maybe beyond what they could already do, but there's only one way to solve the problem. And this is what a lot of the, the balance queuing comes in. It's like there's only one way to balance in the way we want that will give you the experience I've described. So once that happens, once I started figuring out, hold on, I can just apply constraints. I can use drills at the early stage that build up the motor pathways and the sensory mechanism that I want. And then as they get more and more advanced, then these, these things come into play sooner and sooner. Hmm. It's kind of like, you know, it's like a lot of what we've done in... The syllabus that we came together for Hansen Factory is is our combined knowledge on these things, but we think very similarly on the technical side anyway. But it's built on this idea that like we you're you come in as a beginner, never handstand. And from day one of your training, we're actually building the things that become important for one arm. And this idea is uh it's important to have an idea that you go, okay, this is what we're trying to do, these are the constraints, this is the end goal. And can I kind of like, I think of like pruning a tree. We're not giving options. We're removing options. Hmm. It's one of the most <laughs> important things that I came from online coaching. And that's made my real life coaching better because yeah. it's okay. I can, I don't know. I can have a better eye because you only get yeah. video. So you have to be able to spot things faster. Yeah. It's like, I think it, um, one of the, the things that I usually think of is, is more about principles than about, uh, exact techniques in a sense i think yeah. I, I feel the principles are more important in in one way like of course there's like the technical specificity needs to be there as well but if you're uh like i've always tried to kind of distill down like what are the most important things that are always present as you're doing this kind of practice um and what stuff is fluff so the fluff might also be very important, but like certain things will be just instrumental. Like let's say you're going to work on on your like movements in handstand, like in two yeah. arms, you're going to move your legs. Like if you can't balance a straight handstand, like if you can't rebalance from the fingers and from the shoulders uh, in a subtle way, then you're not going to be able to do this uh, other yeah. procedure on top of that either. Like it, it's not going to happen. If you're if you if there's no pressure through your shoulders, your your shoulders will sink. This yeah. is this is, this will be a constant. Like it's not a discussion. It's just physics. Uh, and kind of just to segue slightly on that shoulder sinking thing, it's one of these things you see a lot in a, when you're coaching chest to wall handstands, and you'll see someone like I can hold a 60, 90, 100 
uh, three minute chest wall handstand doesn't matter but you'll see that there's a point where their shoulders sink and then they might re-establish balance or they might mm. not and once you can spot this as a coach you go ah their shoulder has sunk that five millimeters one centimeter mm. then you know they've actually lost balance on a handstand and yeah. they might be 30 seconds into their hold mm. so then you go well this person they're like oh i can hold why can't i balance longer than 20 seconds on the ground it's like well your chest wall stuff yeah. is yeah you don't have the capacity to yeah. keep your shoulder there for long so for just sure. like these kind of small details of what goes into coaching is it is it enables you to give a better realistic expectation to the person and go oh that's why it happened mm. you know or this is why you're losing it and that's why you know you shouldn't be frustrated yeah you should, uh, <laughs> know what's going on yeah frustration is also i mean a large one i guess we're going to speak on on that more properly in another episode but it's 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 an important yeah, thing the in frustration terms. cast yeah yeah <laughs> the fury the fury cast yeah but it's 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 just like such um actually to speak on the frustration one uh, i think just because elisa our producers led in the room uh, she was coaching with Mikhail for some time. She'd learned basic handstands with me and she's doing some coaching with Mikhail. And she just wasn't, she's that person can get a bit frustrated every now and then with training. Uh, Mikhail gave her some of the most contrary advice that any handstand coach would give, but it worked and it took her handstands really to the next level was stop training handstands. You're going to have no sessions and all you're going to do is once or twice a day, you're just going to warm up the wrist quickly or not even bother and just kick up the handstand and see what happens and then if you feel like going on mm. just go on and do some more and if you don't feel like doing it anymore just don't yeah and, and i i think this, this this is like that just happened because like uh yeah she gets or like at least at the point got frustrated by doing sessions and it was hard to find time for the sessions and like then that adds to the frustration because like yeah i'm doing coaching now and i can't do the work i should be doing i feel bad i feel bad no but just just then stop doing sessions and just mess around a bit that's better again something you can do more often and like you can get consistency on it much more efficient than just like having the perfect yeah perfect uh, like a, I thought it was a good program uh, yeah a good read of a person versus a program because mm. the program what a suitor would just be like do endless rounds of conditioning yeah exactly and that was just not going to work too frustrated with that yeah Whereas, exactly it's just not something that would work for the person then it's better to just find find the thing that can can add on to it and it was a uh, yeah, it was one of the moments for me when I was like, okay, this guy really knows what he's talking about. <laughs> he's not just pulling it out of his ass. Yeah. Uh, cool. Let's segue on to, I don't know, when should you start coaching handstands? When? Um, Probably going to rustle some jimmies now. When does start coaching handstands? I think no, maybe I mean, like, when, when, people when start coaching maybe right? when you start, it, it's, it's one, one gen, like it, this is kind of a bit, uh, how to say, uh, it doesn't really fit. But I've, one thing I started thinking of myself is just this, when you start not agreeing with the teachers you've had, <laughs> in one sense. That, that, that's at least my experience. But then again, I came from the circus school uh, way of things and I've been actually very interested in the teaching thing. But I think the main thing is find out whether or not you're actually interested in the subject matter or not. Yeah. Because if you actually are, then you will likely be spending quite a lot of time on it. You'll be spending a lot of time on finding out how it works. And it's just not, it's, it's not just a gimmick or kind of a, I mean, yes, we all need to, to make a living. So that's totally fair enough. But at least then, <laughs> you know, if you're, if you want to put a lot of yourself into it, which will lead to you being able to put a lot of yourself into it. And that's when you can perhaps offer something that is, is genuine and good. And I think like there is no like specific time frame or something like that, but I just think it's it's important to like to have like a good understanding. It's like my analogy for this is always that like like you you don't start to teach guitar lessons just because you learned how to play uh, play a scale. It, yeah, exactly. Like you you learn you learn to play Wonderwall and suddenly you're offering classes. I mean, like you're not really doing that. Um, so yeah. I think it's important to have a very solid sen sense of what is going on and but more importantly a solid interest and solid passion it's for actually like, being able to bring yeah, something to go back to the music thing it's like yeah knowing to play a few songs that's okay you can teach people a few songs but to become a real teacher of guitar and instrument you need to know the theory behind that mm. as much as that so it's like okay do we know the theory 
do I know why we use these cues? This is the thing. It's not the cues are bad, but a misapplied cue can be bad or a misapplied like drill can be bad. But it's like, okay, I'm telling a person to do this because I understand that if I give this cue to this person, I will get this effect. Hmm. So that's kind of the level of thinking you want rather than just like, okay, we're going to do handstands. Okay, kick up. Okay, now do five sets of chest to wall. Okay, do some dish hold. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, yeah, I feel like, oh, don't get me wrong, I understand if you're doing group classes and, you know, you have people scale to appropriate levels in them, then, you know, I, I think like, I think, think may, may, maybe one very important thing in terms of like, since coaching online is kind of a big thing, I think it's, it's, it's probably good to have in-person experience before one does like online work, I yeah, would assume, I just s- because like uh, online work is, is more about just like prescribing a certain, like basically numbers while, uh, getting into kind of the personal relationship things of things as we spoke about and learning to get to know the person is kind of maybe a less intuitive thing to do in that context than in person yeah it's and kinda... like when when you're in person like with people you 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 do get more experience from that per time than you do online so i think that may, maybe that is a good thing in general to like in one sense start locally with that so that you will have a uh, a good understanding of of the kind of um yeah it's what i say to people like who you know i've got a lot of people who want to be coaches who train with me or have over the years i basically say like you shouldn't be online coaching until you have at least a thousand hours in person coaching hmm. <laughs> now that sounds like a lot but work it out per week it's 20 hours a week it's you know it's not even a full-time job hmm. but it's just like there's a lot of uh you'll see that there's a lot of people just going like oh i can do something dm me for coaching and hmm. You know, some people will be good, some people will develop. It's also a bit of a buyer beware, which kind of leads to the next question of like, how do you pick a good handstand coach? Yeah, I mean, I guess someone who you find, I think someone you find interesting and someone who whose words you like, I guess. Yeah. I think that that's or like something that kind of, uh, there's a lot of, of course, personality into it. And there's interesting because like so, some people, uh, want someone who just gives them like loads of numbers yeah. i want to train hard and do the exact things on the paper when i've done so i feel good and if those numbers are correct then the person has progress and some people like to teach like that yeah. some will like to kind of be more kind of sensory or have more of like a kind of rounder approach and so and if that is something that fits then that's that's yeah. cool and there's there's quite a lot of people doing it out there so i think it's ultimately good to try various people as well just to get like a sensation of like okay what's what's going on yeah what i'd say for if you're looking to select a coach or an online coach or program or anything is the great thing about the internet is we can stalk people and (laughs) stalk them that's fine but you're always going to see the best side but then stalk the people they claim to coach and see if they actually have coached them this is the thing you'll see it's quite a i don't know we're going to get onto ownership of people in a bit a while and a ratio of lineage but you'll see a lot of people you know oh it's, you know oh i'm teaching another class i'm teaching this person in person i'm teaching this lots of photos obviously it's instagram but then follow the person they claim to be coaching and see like you know are they actually coaching with loads of people were they really good beforehand mm. this kind of thing and get an idea like not not to call them out on a coach but to go like okay is this person did they start with this person or do this does this person coach people who are like me like if you see someone who's like, I coach 14 year olds in gymnastics and I'm now offering class to adults in their forties or now offering online training to adults in their forties, do they have the apical experience mm. and vice versa? It's like, oh, I see this person who's, you know, look, you know, they're coaching adults and all their adults are over a period of time getting better. Oh, and I'm about the same age range and, you know, fitness experience as this person. Oh, cool. Then you, they probably this uh, thing then coaches can be quite good in domains they can be quite good with like there's loads of really good like i can think of loads of high level coaches i would not send a beginner anywhere near them but i'd send my own advanced students to them to smack my (laughs) mic stand here Uh, i'd send my own advanced students to them for like a phd in hand balance Hmm. in the other sort of arts it's this kind of thing of like the same with like there's other people who are like really good with beginners really really good with beginners I would not send an advanced student near them. I probably wouldn't even send someone who wanted to learn a press to them. 
Mm. But if someone was like, I can't handstand, what do you think of this person? It'd be like, three thumbs up, go to them. Mm. So there is this to watch out for as a coach. Is like, who is your coach good at coaching? Who have they got experience doing? And do you fit in with that mold of what they expect? Mm. Kind of like circuit school coaches. Yeah, like it's... Um there, there, yeah, there, there, there are many, many elements that, that go into this. Like, f- for me, I'm happy that I've worked with like quite a like, wide uh, array of people. But like, I think, I think a lot of coaches ultimately end up doing that if they do it over enough years. And then that again kind of leads into that thing. I like, think are that's you quite new though? Hmm? Like, I think that's quite a new thing where, because if we think, you know, okay, if we think about like if we hand balance has become a bit of its own beast lately. But if you think about like where the traditional places people would learn hand balance, gymnastics, okay, age four to 16, 18. Hmm. So you get hand stands and gymnastics. Circus school, well, anyone who's going to a circus school, particularly, you know, when circus schools weren't as common as they are now, they're generally pretty fucking good already. Yeah, for sure. Generally good, like they came from gymnastics, acrobatics or dance. They're generally pretty flexible things. So the circus school coaches, hmm. other than just had very... Uh, prime candidates for like getting very good and then also like it's not like I hmm, don't want to sound bad by saying this but it's not like the circus school coaches who we consider the top of the game have coached a lot of people no in, it, in terms of numbers not at all yeah you know, but they've they've had a, a lot of time with people who are very good and able to take coaching and cueing very well so they're able to push the art to quite a high level but in terms of like numbers, it's like, you know, when I was in circus school, there was two people in my year. Was it one? One or two mm. doing hand balance. Mm. So, and there was two people at the year below, and I think one person a year behind. So the, the coach there had five students over three years, you know, mm. whereas nowadays you end up with more volume of students, but they're not like I have people who, you know, say, this is online coaching at the moment, I have people who are doing one arms and I have people who are learning to handstand. So we've got more of a range. I think that's quite a new thing as well. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think that kind of like with the internet kind of s- spread of handstands, there's like much more. I mean, yeah, the volume has gone up loads. And then you have like, I think there's loads of capable teachers out there that probably have like a like a reasonable um, uh, range of people that they have taught. Um, and um, that's also something that like, I think it's it's interesting in this like it's a bit old. It's also very internet. This like student teacher relationship whatnot. not. For me, like I don't don't really think it's that interesting. Like if someone wants to learn a thing or two from me, then like, sure, then that's fine. But like, and of course, like I would uh, refer to certain people as yeah, this person was a student of mine. But like I I also think it's important to not like kind of claim ownership over people in that sense and that I yeah. feel is a, that is a bit of an internet thing it's like this is my student as if like I am calling the shot and dictating what that person should be doing and for me it's a little bit like if someone asks me like yeah should do you think that I should do a private session or a workshop or whatnot with this person like, yeah sure why yeah. not like you might learn a thing or two you might develop um yeah if they're good it's kind of yeah, because like, you, 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 you're not gonna. Yeah, you you, you get a like you get a wider amount of experience yourself too, as like as in doing it, as in teaching it, as in whatever. Just because you 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 get to experience these different approaches. Uh, yeah, and I think it's an interesting thing for me as a coach. Is like I'll always basically encourage people. You know, obviously I'm not gonna name names, but there's people I think are good, and there's people I think are bad. If the bad people there, like eh, don't waste your money. But if the people I think good, just go. And then if your student comes back with like, oh, I trained with, say, Yuri Marmerstein. Mm. He's a, I really like Yuri. And I always send people to his workshop when he's around. Go check him out. And if they come back and go, oh, that problem, Yuri told me to try this and this cue. That was really good for me because I go, well, I was trying this and I wasn't maybe getting the result I wanted. And Yuri tried this. It's like, mm. okay, let's see how it works with Yuri's advice. Mm. So, you know, you can learn off your students. But I think the, the ownership, actually, it's one of these interesting things that... Uh, it strays into the realms of fucking creepy for me in some ways. Mm. Like, you know, there's one thing just being proud of your students and going like, oh yeah, they train with me, he's my student. But you'll see like people like, no, no, you don't train with this. No, 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 you must dress this way. Yeah. No, no, no. Like it's, it gets creepy and like, 
you know, I've seen a lot of this over the last while. It's I think there's, there's kind of two extremes on that end. Like, I think the one, the one is that, like, kind of the ownership of people. Uh, you have to follow the, the words of the great leader or else you are a bad person kind of thinking. And then it's the other of, like, um, since it's the Internet, since there's a lot of people that do these things, of course, it's like, uh, and because, like, you become a teacher, you want to do your thing, you want to have it as your job, fair enough. I mean, you, you don't want to go and kind of, advertise your teachers uh, so that you get less work that's it's totally not kind of a viable option i can get it but then again like it doesn't i think it's important just this with like lineage in a sense uh of like just uh like i mean that that is something that i find really good in kind of the circus world of things it's just because like the tradition there has been a lot through like circus families and kind of like I always kind of credit, I like to speak about my coach, Sasha, um, Alexander Gavrilov, who is, was the teacher at the University of Dance and Circus in Stockholm, where I was. Um, and he was an amazing teacher for me. And like my entire work is kind of basically built. It's, a, it's an extension of what he's doing. There's loads of things that he does that I don't agree with anymore. And I'm happy that I don't agree with it. Yeah. Not because I think he's bad at all, all the respect in the world, but there are things that I've experienced to not work in work out in the same way as as um or like as, especially in methodology and technique it's very similar but kind yeah. of this that we've spoken about before as well with like kind of the the need of the update of the kind of circus world of these types of practices yeah it uh, also comes like the context of the context and the people and the population that mm. are exposed to these techniques in mm. the circus world it's like you know you go into circus school or any of these kind of cir- typical circus coaching environments you have that person for three to four years as your coach or you're their student they do these things and it's been shown to work but no one's really questioned whether they're necessary or not but it's just how things are done mm. and again you know, we can't fault it it definitely works but then because we now coach outside that context where i don't you know say circus school you're gonna have you're in there nine to five and then you're probably training after school by yourself as well mm. at the prime of your physical fitness with your coach who's gonna yeah you're doing privates with your coach or like hour or two hour sessions then you're training and then he's probably just sitting around shouting orders mm. at something or just going kind of like walking through the hall going no 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 go practice this so you have a very different context to where we have like here's your program send me some videos mm. okay we're gonna have one class once a week where you come to handstand class and get topped up and hopefully see you then so the methodologies the principles and the technique is the same i suppose yeah but the how you actually get them install them in the body is different yeah like i I think also the um, the, um, maybe like one of the large problems with like the kind of circus school way of things is that like not always but like it, it can be the way that like a student is you're a student and you're the subordinate and i'm the teacher and i am like deciding what is right and wrong and yeah and it's your fault if you fail. Like I've I've been at circus schools where I t- taught people who had kind of been working with that methodology for years, and they're just like, oh, but they're not really having fun anymore because they're being told that they're really bad because the teacher is is constantly hammering on about like a certain thing that they need to do while the person doesn't need to do that whatsoever. It's like one guy that I taught, like he's he's pretty fucking he's really good. I think uh, loads of talent, like. He, he would like without warm up uh, in the morning, just like go into a bridge and pull his legs off into like an ultra deep Mexican, no questions asked <laughs> kind of. The teacher told him like, he was like basically smashing him on like he had to do tuck ups on a box with his hands. He had drawn up lines where his fingers needed to be because he had to have his hands exactly like this and jump up on the box without bending his elbows. Well, that hand position didn't work out very well for him. So he bent his elbows and he got, just got shit for that. <laughs> well, this is a dude that could do flags on one arm. And I was just like, this guy's just getting his time wasted. Yeah. Uh, and I think like that, that is like the, the one extreme of like not allowing, like, cause I, I think that's like- Not just, adapting the technique or your concept yeah, to the person. Exactly. And I think that like with circ, like with handstand or like these kind of technical coachings, both within and f- outside of the circus community there is like this this uh, tendency often to uh, two tendencies I, I i've seen often and that one one is that like uh treating things as being too hard 
watch out, this is too difficult. You need to do basic, you need to do basic, you need to do basic, you need to do basic. <laughs> and then people basic themselves to death because like their basics are never good enough. You must revisit the basic. Yeah, but go sleep then, Jesus Christ. Like it's important to have good enough basics, but you also need to try to do things that yeah. you that are like next level because you need you need to be pushing your level. Uh, and then you have the other side of like just this, that's a classic kind of Instagram throw up the arm and pretend you can one arm technique, which is just <laughs> people just trying to do things cons consequently that is just way too difficult for we them. We should do a show on how to spot a fake one arm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how to set up your one arm so it looks like you can do it with Mikael Christensen and Emmett Lewis. Yeah, how to fake one arm. It's our new but, course coming out soon. But it, it's just like, if like I, I know like a couple of guys that are now like total fucking mutants. Um, uh, and they basically like, became super good in like one third of the time that I did and they did it by just trying to do things like of course they're young they're strong they're really like talented in very many ways but they they, also they practiced practice danger plank yeah they also do that but like they have uh like the, the method of going forward is just trying to do the things they wanted to do uh, but their level was appropriate enough so that like keeping to try to one arm for them was the correct solution one guy named uh, uh, Kalle Löwenborg from from Sweden he's now in ENC in Montreal and I remember when he was training in the circus hall in Stockholm he had just barely learned one arm and he would just try to do one arm switches on a block and I just see him it's like it looked like a train wreck in the beginning but I was like should I tell him to stop and I was like no in fact I shouldn't tell him to stop it because give this guy a couple of years on these switches and he's going to have done 5,000 of them and he's going to be really good and guess who is uh, the boss at switching he, he is of course because he's done them so much well, by the time his one arm was so strong that he could actually catch it easily he had already been repeating the technique so many times so that is, of course, like the, the the one extreme end of the spectrum. I don't think most people should be working one arm switches before they have very solid one arms. Just start one arm switches before you can two arm. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> go. That said, but, I met the dude over here who uh, break dancer. Met him. I met him through a circus meetup one time, and he could just hand up. He could just hand up. Fuck it, on one arm. Couldn't two arm. Couldn't mm -hmm. handstand. Couldn't two arm hand up. Could just do one arm hand hops on his good side only. Classic. Classic. It was amazing. <laughs> and he could just do them like, I don't know, 50, 60 reps easy. Just doing sets like. That was basically me before hand balancing. You used hand to be cool. What happened to you, Mika? Yeah, I used Mika to be cool. I used to break dance and be cool. And I can, I can still hand up pretty well, though. I don't think I can do like 100 anymore, but like I can probably jump a bunch of times. It's, it's yeah. pretty easy. But that air flare <laughs> coming. Oh, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, like the the thing, just to wrap up the thing I said before, just like I think, but I think a lar almost larger problem than trying to do things that are too hard is just spending too much time on this like these endless basics. It's what I call prepolepsy. Prep you, yeah. <laughs> so you just keep doing preparation forever, and you never try to do the thing. You just like I've seen it a lot with like fingertip supported one arms, and they just like stay there forever, but never try to take the arm off because somehow they're not ready. They feel that like it's that kind of idea of expecting the technique to be perfect yeah like, exactly once you take I don't know a lot of stuff in hand balance is like it's perfect against the wall but the second I try to kick up it just becomes yeah, a shit show a fuck. exactly uh, that's okay it's okay to be a bit shit and the thing is for a coach I suppose and this we can bring it back to the coaching is like knowing when to allow it to be shit and knowing when to call the time hmm. that's one of the main skills is just like can we see that the person is actually learning something from this thing they're doing even if it just looks terrible and we get them mm. banned from instagram yeah <laughs> versus you know are they doing something non for well better regressing or changing to something else mm. or just stopping for the day right so we've been going for about an hour and a bit yeah i guess i hope you guys aren't asleep and if you are i hope it's a very deep and relaxing sleep where we install some hypnotic messages <laughs> subliminal so, has that messaging to do uh, don't fall down don't fuck it up don't fall down Push just fingers like, hard. Just just take that, don't fall down, don't fuck it up. And just like take that out of this podcast and put it on repeat and just like put it in your car when you drive, when you sleep yeah. at night, etc. I think we need to go back to our MP3 handstand coach. We're going to have an MP3 where you just uh, 
run it on your phone when you're doing handstand. Point toes, push shoulders, point toes, push shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so to wrap up, uh, I've been Emmett Lewis. I'm here, Mikhail. I am Mikhail. That is true. And big thanks to Elisa, our producer, who was here, but then she snuck out. And as usual, if you're interested in the more practical side of things, uh, we have our courses available on handstandfactory.com. We can basically take you from zero to hero and teach you a straddle handstand in between. But uh, <laughs> no, very good. I think you'd enjoy them a lot if you're into this thing. Uh, other than that, the also Handstand Factory, it does keep the podcast running. We're going to do some more episodes. We've got the rest of the season to do soon. So watch out. And if you have any questions, you know, you can mail them to us at uh, on the contact form on Handstand Factory. And just put podcast questions in the thing. If your question is good, we will read it out. If your question is bad, we'll read it out with your name attached. Suffer. Hashtag suffer. <laughs> uh, over and out. Over and out. <laughs>